So I'm going to give you an overview of installation details, problem areas, uh, performing the assessments, and uh, doing some moisture probing. I don't know if we're going to get uh, to remedies for construction defects uh, just because of the time. This presentation is a little bit longer than an hour. Um, well, who uh, manufactures it? What is it? Um, so formerly, it was the Masonry uh, Veneer Manufacturers Association that um, handled, um, you know, handled uh, the guidelines. Now it's the National Concrete Masonry Association, um, and they define adhered manufactured stone veneer as a lightweight architectural. It's not load bearing. Um, that's a uh, wet cast. It's got blended cementitious materials, aggregates. It will have uh, admixtures um, for the climate that they're in. Uh, other materials, maybe that will uh, uh, give a natural uh, stone appearance. And that's how it's defined. Uh, so it's meant to look like stone. And, you know, it, it has other... Um, um, References, manufactured stone, masonry veneer. We used to call it cultured stone many years ago. Um, you know, like the cultured countertops and things like that. And then just stone veneer. Um, it's a decorative facing material. It's non-load bearing. It hangs on the wall. It doesn't support anything. It's not supported by a foundation. Um, it's secured uh, to and supported by... Uh, the uh, sheathing through adhesion. And I'll go into that a little bit more uh, here. Um, they have the same issues um, um, as uh, stucco, actually, you know, it, because it is a cementitious product. Natural stone veneer claddings um, have, can have the same issues as is heared uh, stone veneer. And by natural, there's, you know, I'm talking about field stone, stone that you would see like uh, sandstone, could be granite, could be um, limestone. I saw a lot of that in Northern Virginia through the 90s and 2000 because I worked up there so much. Northern Virginia, Maryland, the entire area, um, uh, Nova. And it's installed in the same manner as the uh, manufactured stone. Um, you can apply the manufactured stone veneer details to natural stone. And there are references to it. There's a natural stone um, association that has the same details. And they're really good. I'll show you a few here uh, throughout the presentation. I'm not going to give you a lot. and They're not easy to see. Um, I, I put them in here because I had some people that uh, peer reviewed these presentations. And I had to prove what, what I was uh, talking about. Uh, that they're actually, you know, the details I was referencing. So this one's real, real common from the uh, um, adhered uh, manufacturer stone veneer. It's a, this one's a fourth edition, uh, second printing, but it's the same. They now have a fifth edition, you know, fourth printing. Um, so you've got stud framing, you've got exterior sheathing, usually it's OSB. Uh, then you've got two layers of uh, WRB water-resistant barrier. Uh, that's a little different. Um, older um, systems, years back, you would put one on. And then they switched uh, because of a lot of uh, Joe Stebrook's uh, work and presentations at uh, uh, NIBS, the National Institute of Building Sciences. Um, you do a scratch coat, um, embed it uh, with um, lath. Um, it can be non-metallic lath too. And then with the scratch coat, you put your adhesive mortar on, just like you're setting tile. And you can see it on this illustration. Um, then the veneer units are, are placed on there and they're much thicker. They make it look like tile here, but um, I guess uh, maybe somebody can tell me uh, in the chat how many people uh, you know wind up inspecting this or seeing it um, or well, I don't see the chat bars as easily. So now we see this stuff all the time, Stanley. I, I saw it yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've been de I've been dealing with this for, for years as far as stone. When I when I first was taught, I actually was taught stone masonry and did some. Um, 
it was over mason we were putting it over masonry block or something it wasn't wasn't something you considered to put over wood <clears throat> um one of the things about that scratch coat is when you apply it to the lath and you trowel it on, you're keying it into that lath. It goes through the lath and then spreads out a bit, and that's what bonds it. And then you scratch the surface, almost rake it to make it rough so you can get the adhesive coat on. It's the same process you'd use in stucco. Um, uh, matter of fact, uh, one of Joe Steebrook's article refers to it as lumpy stucco. Um, and his opinion of it is not uh, very high, <laughs> but that's kind of him uh, with Building Science Corporation. Um, so if you install it over uh, um, cementitious or concrete masonry units, uh, you can do it without the lath, um, or you can uh, mechanically attach lath and go through the uh, same process. You just don't need a WRB because you're over masonry. So there are problems with it. And there's statistics from Cliff Capson Consulting. They're, they do a lot of relocation inspections and I've done uh, a number for them on the East Coast. So they have some statistics from 2016 to 2018 and I think they're still relevant. Out of a total of 2002 inspections with moisture probing, that's putting a moisture meter into and through the stone into the wood. Um, 98% um, had two or more installation defects that could lead to moisture problems. Out of that, 23% had elevated moisture at the time of inspection. And that's usually considered like 30%. And then 34% had physical damage when it's probed. Um, that's like one third. It's a lot. Um, that's consistent with what I found. And I started, I started doing moisture probing a stone probably 1999. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago, but, uh, I started doing it in Maryland, Northern Virginia, uh, because once we were finding problems under, uh, eaves and stucco, um, it was just, you know, just continue into the stone. So here's, here's a, you know, a sample supplied uh, um, by another colleague. And, you know, you've got the stone veneer. It's out in the Midwest. And they were having moisture problems. And then when they took it off, this is what it looked like underneath. Um, that's as bad as what you hear about on the Eves lawsuits. You know, back in, back in 2000 and the uh, late, you know, 90s. Uh, so you can see the insulation. And... It's it's running up the um, corners even to the siding, so it's not not just a window issue. So, quick question for you, Stanley, because yeah. I remember you know when I was doing construction, which was a long time ago, it seemed like in the winter time the bricklayers and the concrete guys would be sitting in their trucks until noon, hoping it would get above freezing so they could lay brick. Are, yeah, are there, yeah, that's right. right. Are there issues about? Um, uh, temperatures installing stuff under um, different climate conditions. Yeah, yes, but you you come to a different set of problems. Um, then it starts falling off um, because you're dealing with chemical reactions. So this is the same thing as pouring. Co First of all, that scratch coat is concrete, so you've got the same environmental considerations, but you don't have a mass for curing. Um, the next thing you're using an adhesive, so it's actually even more vulnerable. Yeah. So you're setting something like in a tile adhesive. Um, it, so freezing is freezing the, the, the 32 degrees. Is that the threshold? Um, actually, when you start getting down below 50, your sim, cementitious materials um, take longer to cure. So uh, it doesn't have to be freezing uh, for the cure to be different. Remember, um, now we're getting into a little bit of the weeds, but uh, remember, if you're getting down to 35 and your cure rate is is accelerated, then if you're trying to put an adhesive coat over a scratch coat, it hasn't fully set. And you get uh, problems with that. So with the adhesive coat, you would follow the manufacturers, you know, uh, in 
installation instructions. None of us are going to know that. We'll just see it falling off the wall. <laughs> um, a lot of times the temperature isn't as, uh, as important as getting uh, the proper thickness. That scratch coat should be about a half inch thick. Um, you shouldn't see the lath. And that's not usually the case. Uh, or it won't be scratched. I'll show you some examples if we we may have time. You'll have to keep me on track here a little bit because I... Um, I'll try to periodically look at time. All right, so well, you still have 45 is, minutes. Well, you got 45 minutes. I've got a lot of stuff. We might right. wind up doing this a second time. Right. Um, here's an eaves and stone clad house. You can see the stone still on it. Um, the eaves was above. Um, the sheathing had greater damage under the stone than it did um, uh, under the eaves. And I just was easily able to put my hand through the uh, OSB. Uh, identifying it. Sometimes it's kind of hard. Hey, before you move on, before you move on, uh, I, this is the same question that keeps coming up over and over. It's like you sure. suspect it. You wonder about this stuff. But um, and, but you get the opportunity to actually drill holes and whatnot. But, but we're looking at it. And we can't do destruct stuff. I mean, how can we report on what we can't see? Um, I mean, you can't, <laughs> um, isn't that your limitation under home inspection? And I have the same limitations. I mean, I'm, even if I'm probing, even if I'm doing something destructive, I'm only doing it at a selected location based on my professional judgment. So I'm not going, I, I can't characterize everything by that one area i can make a reasonable uh determination but it's it still needs you know to be further investigated even for me um so uh, sometimes it gets easy to tell um loose stones bad detailing details that can lead to moisture um, infiltration and then when you get that, it's like, okay, um, it's a further investigate or assess. Um, that's, you know, that's the best way I can uh, say it. It's, it's kind of like having the indication of termites or wood destroying insects. Yes, we can't, uh, you know, identify them, but you can certainly recognize damage from, um, you know, uh, wood destroying insects. Well, how extensive is it if you only find it at one location? Are they in the wall? Well, it needs to be uh, fully assessed. Um, did that answer your question, Hollis, or answer everybody's? Uh, I, I don't. I think we all know that there is no answer to that question. Uh, but I think what people are wondering is like what, and I think you're probably planning to, take, to get there. Is like what are we looking for that would tell us? that there's a problem. Now, Nick is saying it's all about the detailing, and I think he's right, which is something you just said a second ago. It is uh, a lot about the detailing. And then it's about how they installed it. And a lot of times you're not going to know how they install it until it starts falling off. And that might take a few years uh, to show up. Or it could be high up, and you won't know it until, you know, the stone falls off the wall. Now, see, I'll put a ladder up, you know, but my inspections, I'm going to spend hours, you know, at a locate just on the exterior. So I'm going to put ladders up at various points and, you know, sound the wall and things like that. You, you're not doing that. You can just do an overview. Uh, so we'll look at a few details late, later on. One, I just want you to kind of see some of the examples of how to tell this if you're not familiar. Anybody on the, uh, uh, you know, on the webinar. Um, you, a lot of times you can look for chipped or cut pieces of this, and um, there'll be um, no pigment color inside the um, adhered manufactured stone veneer. It'll have it on the outside, and then inside it'll look more like concrete. You'll see this aggregate, different color aggregate sometimes. Um, there'll also be small voids or air pockets that you don't typically see in natural stone, little, little craters, tiny. I mean, you know, I'm talking like less than a sixteenth of an inch or a thirty second, um, but you'll you'll see them. 
or you come to something like this with columns where you've got these regular, whoops, sorry about that. Not sure if I can go back. Well, um, so I'm a little limited here in my, uh, there we go. Got it. So you see, you've just got that regular and that's a cornerstone. It's like an L shape. Dead giveaway, it's a matter of fact. Um, and there's a problem on those columns if they've got wood in the center. Um, uh, stones are manufactured, they fit in regular patterns usually. You kind of, sometimes it's like somebody would say you could look for the repetition, like one stone will, will be copied or duplicated. Uh, but it, you kind of go a little crazy looking for that because there are so many stones and they'll orient them differently. Um, but the regularity. Uh, here's an example of like natural stone. Irregular, the va venation in it, this is sandstone, um, really tells you. And then you've got this thick mortar uh, because you need that. The stones are usually thicker. Here's one. Um, they were they were kind enough to put my uh, first uh, initial on it S S S. I'm not sure why, but all these stones had S's on them. Uh, but when you look at this, it, these don't really you know strike you. It almost looks like a limestone and mix of stones. But you can see um, um, there are small air pockets, little voids in this, so the surface isn't like a natural stone. And you can see the mortar, this is almost like a dry stack method. You don't see a lot of mortar in between. Uh, these types of stones definitely uh, rely on the adhesive uh, mortar behind them. And if that isn't well done, they tend to fall off. Uh, another type of natural stone that uh, is another presentation of a, this is a building I did. So, um, the thing about me is I've been blessed with a life full of failure. Unfortunately, it's been at other people's expense. Areas of concern. So now we'll get into some of the things. Um, primarily, uh, liquid flow uh, is the big problem uh, with, the, with the stone. You're, you're usually not seeing vapor and things like that. Then the next uh, issue is capillary action being being present at the uh, base or the driveway. Um, most of the time, the liquid flow, you know, your leaks, that's what I'm talking about. It's due to improper installation and not following the uh, MVMA uh, details. No sealants, the caulking around penetrations, windows, doors, small penetrations. Missing inadequate roof flashings, that's another big one. Um, deck flashings gone, um, not having flashings or sealants at cladding, transitions, uh, WRB details, direct water into the wall. In other words, they'll reverse flash it. And instead of having a shingle flashing, uh, flat flashing, um, they'll put the uh, upper one behind the lower one and direct all the water in the wall. You won't know that, you know looking at the exterior, but you may start seeing things inside. Um, missing improper weep screed. We'll talk about the weep screed a little later, uh, but that wasn't common years back. Uh, that also wasn't common with stucco. It got added. Um, stone intersections with dissimilar materials are supposed to have a backer rod and sealant joints. Around windows, doors, all stone terminations with other Materials that are not stone, and typically you don't see that. Um, and all small penetrations have to be sealed. However, it's the uh, sealant at the uh, WRB that's most important for the penetrations, at least the small penetrations, because that's actually what manages the water. Um, they're designed to be uh, installed with the WRB, and there was a group of houses, a number of houses up in Northern Virginia and Maryland where they didn't put anything behind it. They just put the uh, lath directly onto the uh, OSB. And um, that was discovered when they were doing work on the houses. Um, I will tell you the builder was not happy um, with that finding that. 
Um, so that WRB is a drainage plane. It's meant for incidental water that occasionally enters the drain out. It is not meant to have continuous flow. Um, it breaks down. It may be present, intact, but the water repellency, the surfactants on it, um, break down and it no longer functions as a WRB. Um, that's what often gets overlooked. You repair the leak, but you now really don't have a functioning WRB behind this. And that's true on all claddings. It can be vinyl. It's not something people think about. Um, you can uh, overwhelm that, uh, you know, drainage chip plane. The house wreck can be overwhelmed. If you've got that uh, missing kickout lashing, there can be so much water that comes in, it just deteriorates and fails. Um, sometimes you can get uh, one layer of, I'll just say house wrap, but I'm going to refer to it as WRB, for a rain screen drainage uh, plane system. That's where you have a space or you have a different type of, um, um, you might have a uh, a channel or something installed in the wall that allows water to drain through. Um, and here's some of your their ASTM standards uh, for the WRBs that they have to comply to. Not all house wraps are made the same, and that's another talk. I've experimented with some, and it's surprising the differences. Um, they're not even uh, tested the same way. Uh, the testing for felt is not the same as the test for Tyvek. So, uh, it's not even comparable. There's a number uh, 30 felt, uh, you know, the type, just to break up the words on the screen here. Uh, so here's an example. You know, you've got two WRBs. Uh, this is in preparation for, and you actually have a uh, drain screen, you know, principle. So you've got a house wrap on there, and then you have the felt put on um, over that. And the purpose of that why they came out with the two, two uh, WRBs is the fir that first one that you see up there, the easy guard, acts as your, tr your drainage plane. The felt is a sacrificial layer. It gets wet, it crinkles, it makes that space between the lap and the house wrap. And then if you damage it or the mortar sticks to it, which it will, it doesn't matter because the house wrap's all intact. Uh, okay, you start at the bottom, you have a shingle fashion, and you won't you won't really know if it's done right. Um, I might find out, you know, when I start cutting things apart. Um, I think I went over this about the pr purpose of the inner layer. Um, what they found on this um, uh, two-layer system is when you had one house wrap, and this was an experiment done years back, when you put the mortar on it with stucco um, through the lath, the mortar actually stuck to the house wrap and actually took the writing off of it and, uh, you know, pieces of it. So it didn't, it, it, it basically damaged your first layer house wrap. And that's where it came about. Well, if we put two on, we stopped that from happening. WRBs, minimum of uh, two inch horizontal uh, joint lap, six inch uh, vertical lap, 16 inches uh, inside and outside uh, corner lap. So you wrap it around the corners in both directions. A lot of times on the stone, when you get to the trim, they won't have any sealant and they'll just have mortar. You can look at the trim where it makes a transition from the decorative stone, say on the front of the house, or just wrapped a foot around the corner. And you can look at that. And sometimes they won't have a WRB. They just, you know, cut it or don't continue it around the house. John Craner had a good, uh, you know, little picture of that that he sent me, where it's like you look at the siding and there's no there's no WRB visible between the trim piece and the siding. Uh, is it all over? Don't know. But it certainly means that it should have a further investigation because that's a major issue. Um, that house wrap should be integrated and installed with all the flashings and accessories and the weep screed and everything else that's done with it. A lot of times that doesn't happen. 
So this is a fairly new house in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And there's um, there's there's going to be more on this. You'll notice there's no WRB. There's no wrap around the window. This window's installed, and it's not a pressure design system. Um, and then they're installing the uh, the stone. So you can see the lath there. It's a self furring lath. At least they have enough nails in it. Um, it's fairly large stone. It is, it is adhered. You can see the flat backs on them. And, um, you know, it's it's just designed to fail. So even if you, you look at that, if you get any water in, and this was an oceanfront location, which you know you're going to get water in, it's going to go right behind that um, house wrap, the, um, um, the felt. So happens all the time. Here's one. So you've got your stone skirt. You look here in the investigation. I don't see any uh, WRB. There's no house wrap behind the stone. Not installed and then certainly not integrated into it. So this is definitely going to be a problem. So this is a picture of self-furring lath over a WRB. Um, but you'll notice that you're supposed to have flashing here at the stoop. How can you integrate the flashing if the WRB and the lath are already installed? You can't. Um, mortar shrinkage is common, especially when you get to um, um, natural stone. This is more of a, you know, granite. Of, so you've got the shrinkage right here. Is that a problem? Uh, no, but it does let water in just because this, this looks solid. This stone isn't going to get water through it, but the mortar will, and these type of joints will. So here's adhered uh, stone being installed. Um, the Tyvek, when you see here, you don't see any Tyvek below that. There's no way to overlap this properly with two um, um, two inch horizontal lap joint. So. Here's, here's an example being adhered on there, and you can see the little spacer stone stuck in there, to, just like you would with tile to hold it in place. But it's wrong. Uh, Multi-floor building, you know, the water damage basically starts up here and goes all the way down at these uh, flashings that are uh, parapet flashings. Um, all right, the house. And... The window. So I had high moisture and soft, soft sheathing below uh, the window. And that's the window. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, I got a got a problem here. So of course I cut it open. I take a stone off. So I use a diamond blade and a grinder. And this is a field stone. This is this is true stone, natural stone with the full mortar around it. And, you know, first taking it off, it's got the lath. Uh, it's well adhered. Um, this is these this is process is time consuming, by the way. Um, so it does have the commercial what they used to call stucco wrap uh, from Tyvek on, under it. Um, that does create a drainage plane. And then when I cut away the Tyvek, I've got another um, um, woven uh polypropylene uh, WRB here, but you'd see the rust on that nail and the rust that's been carried through. So it's definitely been getting a lot of water. And I just took a wooden um, um, paintbrush, a cheap one, and stuck, uh, stuck it through the OSB to show how bad it was. But I want to show you something here. That's the inside of the wall where I cut out the drywall because the homeowner wanted me to look at it without removing the stone. And that OSB looks good, doesn't it? And this is what it looks like from the other side. You can't necessarily do your inspections by cutting holes in the interior of the house. A lot of times the rot doesn't show up or you've got framing that hides it. And you don't really see how bad it is because it's starting from the outside and working its way in. 
So here's a detail uh, on the weep screen. And I just want to show, show this. Um, a lot of times this would get left off. It would just have maybe a casing bead or would just run down and the lath would come out there. If you're really exiting the daylight, it's wrong, but it worked okay. And that's how it was done for years. Um, you know, then they put this detail in here. So you've got to have your WRB overlap this. And then the water goes out <coughs> and exits through, um, you know, small holes in it. It's supposed to be two inches above paving, unless the paving's supported by the foundation, like it's part of a, you know, a driveway or a porch. Uh, four inches above soil. Um, you need the clearances. Typically what happens is this just run down to the ground. Um, people are asking, how can you tell? Well, one thing you'll almost always find is they'll just stick, put it on top of the driveway. One of the reasons you want to space there is, you know, there's a, a hard, um, hard surfaces will move, you know, have a certain amount of movement and the stone will break off at the bottom. The other reason is you want exit point for water. If you mortar it to the driveway or to a porch, you have no way for the water to exit. You're just making a, um, a cup inside there if it gets in. Um, and if it goes into the ground, you wind up having a termite you know, location, um, access point, as well as maybe a moisture wick up. You know, it'll, it'll go from the ground. If you're running here, it goes the way up. Although typically they're installing it over masonry and running it to the ground. Here's another uh, detail on that, you know, with the um, with the rain screen. So um, let's see. Let's go over to this one. All right. So here's another um, another one. This is what you're looking for when you talk about rain screen. So here's your house wrap, and it's it's a standard home homeowner grade house wrap. You've got a the windows wrapped, wrapped a lot. Uh, you've got some felt here, and then you have this uh, kind of grooved uh, foam. So you're making a space there with the stone, and that creates uh, a drainage plane, a, a little extra insurance that the water can move through it quickly. Uh, and that's really the preferred method. It's it's not used a lot. Um, so here's a foundation wall with the weep screen flashing. That was put in after uh, as it was a repair. So that's why it looks so new. Um, and the stone was pulled out of the ground to do that. And here's a close up. You can see the, the flashing there. And then the weep screen is right there. And you see the holes along here. So that's a, you know, a fairly a complex thing to do if you have to do that because you have to take the stone off and reinstall it maybe you have to buy new stone um you can't just cut it away it looks it looks terrible you have to cut it away in a surgical manner or cut the stones here's one uh where they have the foundation uh wall at uh, a porch and they uh, had to come back and install a weep screed and they cut the stone to do that and then they sealed the uh, porch. Another weep screed installed um, flashing where they uh, lifted the stone above and then went ahead and installed flashing to uh, cover the wood at the uh, wall um, at the porch here. Now we'll get into uh, some other things. Um, I want to mention that uh, when you run that stone continuously over the wood wall and then onto the foundation, um, you don't usually see much problem at the foundation where you've got that masonry and the stones running over that to the ground. It's still not supposed to be done that way. But you don't usually get a big problem with that. But you need a way for the water to drain. And you, what they're supposed to do is have a drainage mechanism, you know, right where the wood transitions to masonry. So you're draining the wood, framing, and then you're just putting the stone on the masonry and you just have a little 
a little weep screen there. Uh, that's another thing you don't see, where they don't put it low enough down. So here's this window, and we go back to that same house. It's not sealed. It's just the mortar um, right next to the window. That is wrong. Making the mortar tight, making the stone tight against the window, does not seal the window from water. It only screws up the window or the stone. Here's another one. So you've got a vinyl window, and they just installed it tight. Um, the problem is, is the people installing the stone don't, they are okay with masonry, but they don't know any of these details and nobody's telling them. Here's another one. You look right here. Um, you've got uh, bare wood. So they put uh, uh, coil stock over it and then they put the stone on and they mortared right up to that. And now you've got the bare wood of the, uh, of the uh, tr you know, trim around the window and it's just gonna rot out, be a leak point. Um, oops, sorry. There it is. This is what's called easy bead. It's used instead of backer rod. So you would put this, you'd put the stone here, and then you'd run this. This would be um, tacked up, and here would be a window or a door. And then the stone would go up to it, and then you would just put your sealant right over this. So it basically makes a backer rod and it seals it. Really easy detail. You make your joint, you get a three eighths inch joint. That's what you're supposed to have around windows and doors, at least that. Um, sometimes you need bigger if you get some of these palladium, the largest ganged windows, like 10 foot window, you're gonna have a lot of thermal movement if it's aluminum. But that's not something you need to look at, but you will encounter it if the window is uh, smiling at you or doesn't, you know, the sash and the uh, um, um, stool don't don't meet up properly. There's an example, this is hard to tell, but this is that foam on the easy bead. So that's the lip, that's the foam. And then you see they never covered it with caulk, so the foam has just deteriorated in the sunlight and now become powder. Um, and of course, they didn't put it here. So, you know, it's it's a good, uh, that was a good try. Um, I tend to think that maybe in today, when we've been telling people, that's a good effort, that's a good try. And so people don't feel bad as children. I'm not sure we're really teaching about the real world. Good efforts don't necessarily make it when your building rots out. Um, example of what uh, damage can be like uh, below a window with stone. There's an exterior view and uh, an interior view, two different uh, windows. Um, just to give you an idea, some of you do mold or, you know, deal with that. A lot of times you may do something like just a quick sample in the house uh, for mold. I know some, I know that's not really under ashy, but people do it. Well, you might pick up, uh, you know, a lot of spores. You might not have any idea that the walls inside there are looking that bad. You know, if there's not something obvious, there could be something hidden. And then the trick is how to find it. So here uh, we start to take this apart. Notice the WRB doesn't go into the window, just goes up to it. And of course the window is showing evidence of water intrusion. So here's an example. You wrap the opening, you know, these are the details. They've got like a, I don't know, um, um, 65 pages or more of details. There's uh, really no excuse. And here I'm showing the 3 8 inch joint at the window um, a sill. A lot of times you'll get the uh, jam of the window will have a sealant, but the sill won't. It'll just sit on top of us, the uh, stone water table. Hey Stanley, well, do, do you mind if I interrupt for just a minute here? Because we've no. got fifteen, we have fifteen minutes left, and the questions are just coming in so fast that I stopped interrupting you because you would never, you'd never got anywhere. 
So here's what I'm going to suggest, and maybe this is sure. the wrong time to ask this, uh, but a, a couple of people have actually asked, asked you to come back. Um, and I'm wondering if we could negotiate in real time with you um, so that you've got a couple of minutes to, you know, so you, so you can kind of plan this last 15 minutes uh, to do it, you know, to do whatever you're going to do in the next 15 minutes with the understanding that you're going to come back again. Okay. Okay. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to save all of the questions. Okay. And I'm going to write them into a document and send you all the questions that you can prepare, use to prepare for when you come back. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm, okay. I'm going to get out of your way. We're going to stop interrupting you unless I see oh, one. No, that no, 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 that's a, that's great. I told you this is, this subject is normally like a two hour talk. Yeah. 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 And, Let's do it and, that way. So guys, you know, keep putting your questions in there. I'm going to capture the questions. Keep putting the questions in the chat. Yeah. I'm going to capture them before I close the room tonight. And then we're going to send the questions to Stanley and then we're going to invite him to come back uh, with a list of armed with the, with the answers to these questions. Because otherwise, we're never going to get to the. We're never going to. Well, you're not even. He, to the he end won't have. Anyway. We'll be. We'll be doing all the talking because all we're going to yeah. be doing is asking questions. There's you so know. many. And the thing is, it's um, uh, a little bit. Um, when I do this, I usually um, I often uh, speak a little faster and go through this. But being on a, a meeting, a Zoom, I'm not sure of the uh, of the pacing and dynamics since I don't see everyone. Um, you know, if if I'm moving too fast or too slow, so well, it's you certainly have their attention. Point. You certainly have their attention because they're asking questions left and right. Good, that's that's fine. Yeah, um, you know, uh, that is absolutely fine. We'll get through. You won't get through everything, and then the questions will be important, and we can see how we'll do the next one. Okay. Okay. Uh, with this. Um, Here's another detail showing that three eighths inch join at the jam of the window. Oh, I'm not or door. Yeah, you know, they have a similar detail. I just want you to see. It's like I'm not, you know. Because you'll go out there and you'll say, "Well, you're supposed to have a joint here. You're supposed to have a minimum three eighths inch joint." And everybody go, "No, I'm not." You know, it. I don't need it. Well, the the manufacturers the concrete masonry veneer association has agreed on these details all the manufacturers you may not know the manufacturer but this is a manufactured product um don't have to quote code you have to install it according to the manufacturer's instructions and if you don't it doesn't meet code but you don't even mention that that's how it's supposed to be done you know So here's an example of a closed cell backer rod uh, as opposed to the easy bead. This is too tight here, but you know, I can live with that. Uh, however, they never installed the sealants. They just put the backer rod in left. Um, luckily it was in the shade, so it didn't deteriorate too well. It does help keep some water and insects out. Here's one. Um, they put a fillet bead. So, they essentially ran the mortar up there, but then they decided to seal the window. So there's a, they put this bead of sealant, whoops, over, over it. The problem comes about with this is the thermal movement of these windows. You've got, this mortar isn't going to move. You've got the stone as a thermal movement, but you get to this an aluminum clad window and that aluminum is going to expand and contract just like vinyl siding. You guys know that you know, how much aluminum siding would move if you're that old <laughs> to go back to that. And that larger window is going to thermally expand. It's going to hit the mortar. And what's going to happen is the jam, the sill, they're going to bow up. And then you're going to get that gap there. And the only fix of this is to cut this out. You know, now here they put the sealant bead in. And if it's a small enough window, a lot of times it will be okay. It does seal it. Got right. Here, the um, um, the repair was scoped to remove the mortar and make a 3 8 inch uh, gap. So the contractor, what he did is he said, why do I need to cut the mortar out? I've got all this trim. I'll just cut the trim board. I'll cut this back, and then I'll paint it and seal it. 
So if you've got that trim detail, it's pretty easy to get this, uh, you know, expansion joint around windows and doors. Uh, here's one done correctly. Uh, not, not too often, but that's what it should look like. And when you press on this, it should have give. It shouldn't be solid. That should have, you know, you should be able to press in on it. It should rebound. Um, that's a low modulus. Um, this window is sealed, and they sealed here, too, you know, the uh, stone. Uh, one thing you have to watch out here, though, is the million cobbler strips, because water can bypass the seal and get in there. I talk about that a lot, almost every presentation. Here they did a nice job at the um, uh, stone and uh, porch uh, threshold. Um, you know, that's that's the right way to seal. Unfortunately, they did run the stone uh, down um, here, and they've got, I don't see anything done totally right. And, of course, there's no uh, weep screed, but it's a low likelihood of war. Here we're looking at, here's the outlet, um, not, you know, the outlet here. And you notice I can actually just see the um, uh, wood behind it. Here we've got the light. Light fixture is not sealed. This light was loose, and you can see the box. It's just sitting proud. It's just a leak point, especially if you get to any sort of water location like uh, the Chesapeake Bay or Ocean. Here's that detail I was talking about. You know, when you put your house wraps on, your primary weather waterproofing is around this house wrap, WRB. You've got to seal this tape and seal it so that when water runs through, it goes around this and doesn't backtrack into the into the wall in the house. Um, even though you're sealing the outlet or sealing the light fixture, that seals one point, but a lot of times this gets overlooked. You won't know it unless you take it apart. But that's one of the issues, you know? Um, but usually when you start seeing some things done wrong, you know, they probably didn't get this right either. And this just gives a detail of how it's, you know, showing how it's supposed to be installed. Another one, you know, in the uh, um, uh, exterior flange and a beta sealant, usually all you see is they put something over the top. But you're supposed to, like, put a bead of sealant here, make a gasket seal, shove the flange into it. Um, a lot of times what you expect is to see some squeezed out here. Um, but usually what you see is some silicone just applied to the outside that's falling off. Um, this is nicely done. However, a block of wood doesn't really make a good surface for caulk, um, you know, the sealant to adhere to. And usually it releases on the end grain first, uh, but it, it was kind of a good try. This is a kick out flashing. We all know what this is. Um, all stone is supposed to have a kick out flashing. Uh, this was after the uh, fact. It's supposed to go under the uh, uh, felt, you know, the roof uh, underlayment, or at least under the starter course of shingles and the, um, the upper shingle. Usually what I'll find is it'll be set on top of the starter course of shingle, which means if water goes down it, it can bypass the kick out. Uh, that kick out's supposed to be sealed too. So typically this is what I find. Um, a piece of flashing kind of stuck on the roof. Um, the stone is supposed to be held two inches off the roof. Um, it's resting on the shingles. Real, real common. Um, and, you know, of course, you're draining the upper roof onto this point, and it had a lot of damage under it. Brand new home. Okay, this is not, this is natural stone. Look at how they did the uh, flashing. They didn't, they don't put the stone over, they don't integrate it with the house wrap. They just put it on the top and, and um, caulk it. And, of course, you can see it failing here right here and here. Um, nice try, um, but it's what we typically see on chimneys. Uh, poorly done. No kick out, stone run to the roof, and the damage under it. 
um, courtesy of another colleague. Um, it's totally destroyed. It's only a few years old, you know, the installation. And there's another view of it. Um, okay, it looks like I've got like five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. Um, you can usually pull that apart with your hand. Now, there can be a WRB there, um, but it won't matter because it'll just be so wet all the time. It'll, um, it'll degrade. And that's true with these liquid applied coatings too that you see going up, especially on commercial buildings. I've done a lot of work on them. Uh, here's just a schematic for people. You can't really tell it, but it just shows what I'm saying is actually in the um, diagram. You know, your, your kick out is supposed to keep the water from going behind the stone because you've got this thick wall cladding. With clapboard, you could just run your step flashing up over the clapboard and bend it out a little bit. That's how I was taught years back, you know. Um, but since you had clapboard, you were layering your step flashing. Um, two inches above the roofing. Uh, where this becomes problematic is where, you know, a lot of times, uh, like some of the manufacturers years back would just have three inch step flashing. Um, that was, you know, accepted. Now it's, um, now it's a minimum of four inch. Um, but the way you deal with that is you just install a counter flashing over this you know, over your step, and then you do your same details with the weep. Um, here's a um, polypropylene, you know, plastic uh, kick out. We see these all the time. It's sealed. You know, it's properly done. This was an after fact. They cut the stone above there to make a little space. It's not two inches, but they had to deal with what they could work with. You still see the stone dust on it. Um, interesting thing about these things, though, is... Uh, they seem really durable, but I had one house with like nine kickouts in Richmond, Virginia, and the squirrels ate every one of those kickouts back. And that that was a that was a re, a repair ten years ago, and then they had to go back and replace the kickouts again. Only time I've seen it. Um, so if you see little gnaw marks or irregularities, it could be a rodent. All right, bay window with roof, wall termination uh, needs a kick out. Uh, so you got window, and it's not a very big bay window. I mean, it's small, a small roof. So here's the here's the detail. This is how they did the roof. They did hold the stone above the roof. They've got weep screed, but they didn't install a kick out. So inside the house, you look here. I go in, and I see these stains right under the kick out. It usually is not this easy. What's interesting though, is this was dry, but I went to the floor and on my meter here, I have about 35% moisture reading in the baseboard drywall area. So I didn't have any moisture up. It was accumulating at the floor and no evidence of that. Another natural stone, no kick out flashings installed uh, where the roof terminates at the wall and the stone runs down, you know, to the roofing. And, you know, those are, that's a high end home. Um, gutter, you know, leaf guards, expensive shingles. Uh, of course, it had problems. And this, you know, what you'll find, even this small roof area. You can see that whole area was just totally uh, damaged and degraded. Um, here, brand new house, new stone. There's the porch. How are they going to integrate that porch roof to the stone? They installed the stone. They made no allowances for that porch roof. They run that stone right down to the uh, um, roof deck. And... There's no uh, there's no uh, kickout flashings at the end here. Um, luckily, I was not inspecting that house for uh, for the stone um, or that, but it just struck me. It's it's like it happens continuously, and that was an expensive house on the Potomac. 
Um, let's see, how are we doing here? Um, well, on time, we can stop here. Yeah, why don't we stop here, Stanley? I've got a, um, well, first of all, before we, before we cut you off, um, I would like to uh, express our gratitude for uh, everything you've um, you've done for us here today, and I'm going to thank you in advance for for um, uh, promising to come back again.